grace and peace to you, church. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, welcome to worship with Amity Presbyterian Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Before we begin worship, I invite you to take note of some things in the bulletin. Um, one is the Amity Presbyterian Women Fall Gathering, which is on Tuesday of this week. Um, if you've got questions about that, then Donna is the one to see. Um, you are invited to that fellowship gathering. And I want to also point out, um, we probably, oh, I don't know, far too long ago, <laughs> you all got an email, the Amity newsletter, and you haven't gotten one since. <laughs> but I am happy to say that it is, we are getting that off the ground again. Um, and so you'll find some information about the newsletter in there, um, in your bulletin under the announcements. The main thing to note is if you would like to submit something for the newsletter, you need to send it to this email address in the bulletin. It's not the same one as it was. It's amitychurchnews at gmail.com. So just make sure that you take note of that. If you need something that you don't want to email it, call Adrian in the office and she can help you, okay? Um, but that is going to be coming out uh, the very beginning of October, if not a little bit before. So um, please take note of those changes. We're excited to get that going again. And then we have a save the date. You can see a big, big flyer in there. Save the date, the fifth Sunday of this month, we will be having a bilingual service as one whole church as well as lunch after that. So I invite you to read about that and the ways to help prepare for that and uh, make plans to be here. All right. I also wanted to mention, I forgot to say it last week, with our series, Do Unto Others, that we're doing during the month of September, we have a few, I have more if you need them, guided journals. This is to take home, um, that you can do at home, work through the series as we worship here on Sundays. These are things you can do throughout the week to help you really dig in to the theme, okay? Wanted to make sure to mention that. They will be on that table there. And if we run out and we need more, I can print you one. All right. Whew. Take a breath. <laughs> My friends, it is time to come together to worship God. So I want to invite you to rise as we sing our theme song, Christ Has Broken Down the Wall. We learned it last week. If you can't remember it, you'll pick it up quickly. Let's rise and sing as the Christ light is carried in. has broken down the wall. Christ has broken down the wall. Let us join our hearts as one. Christ has broken down the wall. My friends, turning towards the Christ light here in the center. The act of coming together is revolutionary, which in its earliest form meant finding a course around a central point. So we gather around the light of Christ as our center and guiding light of our lives. This becomes our central point of reference for our relationships and our love in the world. This is our compassion revolution. So I invite you to pray. Reconciling God, we ask you to help us open to compassion, for we are a divided world, and the conflict is waging even within us in this moment. Empower us, invite us to do unto others, to do unto ourselves and to others in ways that build up your kingdom 
and your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the center that holds, and in the power of the Spirit that transforms. Amen. Friends, let's continue singing. Be accepted as we are. Be accepted as we are. Sometimes I can't make out my own thoughts, much less yours. Making sense of this life and this time seems unreasonable. What if we never figure it out? What if we become too estranged? I cannot imagine your viewpoint. I am not sure I am willing to believe that any solution will work. Wait. Breathe. Let the anxiety take a break for just a moment. Breathe, Breathe again. again. We are not alone. Christ, Christ is, is with, with us. us. Church, let us take a deep breath together. The rhythm of our breath and our heartbeat is the same. Our desire for life and for love is the same. Our desire for a peace in which we flourish is the same. Let this moment permeate our souls and let us pass the peace of Christ between us, this peace that is meant for all people. Church, the peace of Christ be with you and also so with you. you. I invite you to rise and greet your neighbor with the peace of Christ. remain standing as we sing our hymn together.
Please be seated. I'll invite children forward. Come on down to the front. And would anybody else like to ride on our bus today like we did last week? Let's get somebody that'll ride with Dave. <laughs> All right. All right, Julie, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, here, Dave. Okay. Woo. Welcome, friends. <laughs> so happy you're here. Are you guys ready for another stop on our Jesus bus tour? <laughs> yes. All right, well, we're in the bus, so let's get ready to go. All right. <laughs> Where are we going today? We are going on a camping trip. In the Woohoo! Who's excited? Oh. Oh. What's the matter, Tate? I don't, I don't want to say. Oh, come on, we're friends here. You can tell us. Well, that's the point. Out there in the woods, I think there are scary things that are not our friends. I'm scared. Mm. Well, you know what? Are you scared too? Yeah? That's fair. It's okay to be afraid, isn't it? Let's stop the bus for a minute, okay? Okay. <laughs> we just stopped. Do you think it's okay to be afraid? Davy and Julie, do you think it's okay to be afraid? Yes. Yeah? I think so too. Sometimes people say, oh, don't be scared. Don't be afraid. You don't need to feel that way. That's silly. <laughs> But feeling what we're feeling is never silly, right? It just is. They're just our feelings. And when someone says that they are afraid or scared or mad or sad or any other feeling, we don't have to talk to them or talk them out of it. We just have to say, sometimes I feel that way too. I understand. Hmm. Well, let's, let's say that to Tate. Let's help Tate, Tate out in a, here for a minute going to say to Tate that it's okay to feel afraid. Ready? It's okay to feel afraid. Wow, I feel better already. I feel like you understand me. <laughs> well, that's what happens when we listen to the way that people are feeling inside. Sometimes they feel more understood and less alone, don't they? That brings us to our word for today. Compassion. You heard that word? Yeah. Compassion means that we stop the bus, we pause what we're doing for a minute to really be with somebody and let them know that we can. What are some things, some other things that we could say to Tate to make him feel better? What do you think? You're afraid to? Yeah, I'm afraid too. That's a good one. What else? It'll be fun. Talk about the good things, yeah. Sometimes being scared is the fun part. Ooh, that's why people go to scary movies and things, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. What a great way to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think I'm ready to go. Okay. Ooh, here we go. Ready? I'm so glad I have you all with me. That road was rough. When the going gets rough, we all need friends we can get. That's right. We need all the friends we can get. You know, Jesus said that we can have compassion for all people, even the ones that we don't think are our friends. There's lots of stories about Jesus helping out people who were supposed to be his enemies. We need compassion because we all get scared or mad or anxious or sad sometimes. We're just humans, right? Yeah. When we get all cozy in our tents, I want to tell a bedtime story that I just remembered that would make me feel friendly even towards the critters that I'm scared of out here. <laughs> it says, the wolf will live with the lamb, the calf and the lion will feed together, the cow and bear shall graze, and a little child shall lead them. That story is out of the book of Isaiah, which was part of Jesus' Bible when he was growing up. I'll bet that meant a lot to him. He learned to reach everyone, learned to teach everyone to live peacefully together. Mm. Do you think you could lead like the little child in the story? Who led them into kindness and compassion? Hopefully, yeah. 
Yeah. It could lead us all to practice more love, more kindness, more compassion. Maybe this week you can take time to be with someone who is not feeling okay. To be with them and say, it's okay to feel sad or mad or glad or scared or whatever. I understand and I'm right here with you. Mm -hmm. If you're that person, sometimes we have to let people know how we're feeling so that they know how to respond so they can help you and be with you. Yeah? Yeah. If the person wants a hug or if you want a hug, that's another great way to show that you care if they say it's okay. Right? Yeah. What a great way to do unto others. I sure love having compassion done unto me today. <laughs> we'll be back next week, so join us for our next stop on our tour. <laughs> you want to say a prayer? All right. Let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for friends and people who care. Help us care about others and be with them in their feelings. <laughs> in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. That's all right. All right, you can go back to the playground. <laughs> and worship from there. In our series, we are examining the news that we take in and that we share. We're looking for the really good news that can sustain us in the long haul. And so together we find ways to tell deeply good news for all people, maybe by filtering our interactions through the lens of compassion. Today's scripture from Isaiah gives us what feels like an impossible vision. Those who are enemies existing peacefully together. It's said that if we can envision something, we can work towards it. Can we believe in the vision that the scriptures offer of a way of being full of the knowledge of God instead of our own limited imagination and knowing? So as you hear these words of Holy Scripture from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9, I invite you to listen with hope that this vision will become reality for all creation. Listen to God's word. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of God, and it is for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. To God. What a vision the prophet Isaiah is given to share. What beauty, what hope, what peace. We often hear this poetic passage during Advent, don't we? As we anticipate the coming of the Christ child who we hope will lead us toward such a peaceable kingdom. Poets and artists of all kinds have brought this vision to life many times over. I even had a poster hanging in my childhood bedroom of Gregory Perillo's elaborate and colorful painting of this passage. I remember just studying every tiny detail of the image when I was little. In that particular painting, it still brings me a warm comfort when I see it. I think many of us find comfort and hope in these words from Isaiah. 
That was, in fact, the purpose of this vision when the prophet shared it with the people of Israel and Judah who were the first to hear it. He was speaking at a time when the kingdom of Israel had been utterly destroyed by the Assyrians. They were scattered and wounded and captive. The world, as they knew it, had fallen apart. According to the prophet's words before these that we read, it was because God had grown angry and tired of their lack of justice for the poor and their lack of faithfulness to the Lord. If we put ourselves in their shoes in that moment as best we can, we can imagine that if they had managed to survive this far, they would have likely been traumatized. They would have been trapped in this identity crisis, wondering how they, the Lord's people, got to this awful state. Who even were they now? Do they still belong to God? Had God chosen others after all this time? How could they ever get back to the life that they knew before? Well, this is when the prophet Isaiah casts his divine vision. And if we listen, he doesn't offer them a way back. He doesn't offer them a playbook for how to get back in God's graces or even get back at their captors. He offers them hope. Hope for the peace that will be. Not the peace that can be or might be. Not a peace for them at the expense of their enemies. It is an incredible peace that must include everyone. If it does not include everyone, it's not God's peace. The wolf and the lamb, the calf and the lion, the little child and the viper, they must all be present and safe with each other. Now that I really think about it, I actually wonder how that vision was originally received. Did that feel hopeful to them? Did it feel hopeful to imagine coming to the table with the people who had taken everything from them? Did they want that kind of peace? Or did they want vengeance? Did that kind of peace even feel possible? Does it feel possible to us now? Though the divisions here in our country are not caused by a brutal invading foreign power, many of us feel paralyzed with these same questions, don't we? Who are we as a people? Where do we go from here? How can I find peace within myself, let alone with those that I disagree with passionately? We can't even agree on the definition of peace. <laughs> Last week in our Do Unto Others series, we looked at the essential place choosing to be kind to others holds in our ability to find the common good. Guided by the teaching of Jesus to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, we must begin with kindness no matter what. Well, this week, the words of the prophet Isaiah invite us to take a step beyond kindness into compassion. In order for God's peaceable kingdom to be made visible on earth, we must learn to be compassionate. So what does it mean to have compassion? Well, first place to start is the dictionary. Merriam-Webster defines the word compassion as the sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. 
So compassion doesn't just notice and feel for someone else. It compels us to get involved. I think I like um, the theologian Frederick Buechner. I like his definition best. He says, compassion is sometimes the fatal capacity for feeling what it's like to live inside somebody else's skin. It's the knowledge that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy finally for you. Hmm. Peace is not just the absence of conflict. It's also the absence of suffering. And all conflict is somewhere rooted in suffering. If we want to build bridges across the conflicts that divide us, shouldn't we be willing to come close enough to the other to listen for their pain? When we begin to recognize the pain of the other, we follow the way of Christ. We are with them. We are listening. And then we have a desire to alleviate their suffering as if their wounds are our own. That's what compassion is. Passion with another, in which both parties are seeking a better peace for all parties. This week has been a difficult one for all kinds of reasons, but not the least of which is what happened at Appalachie High School in Winder, Georgia. Most of us have been seeing the videos and the interviews and people arguing about what to do on the news all week. It's a strange time we live in because not only do we constantly hear the <clears throat> opinions of people like politicians who are commenting on this tragedy from a distance, but we could see videos made by students who were there that day. And they post them on social media, like TikTok. And they tell their story. Many of them begging those with the ability to change things to please just do something. I think of those stories, those voices, those faces, when hearing the words of the prophet, and a little child shall lead them. Can we not be led to compassion by the suffering of our children? Can we not build bridges long enough to recognize and to respond to the pain and the fear of these little ones? I find myself asking, how did we get to a place where this is expected, where this is somehow acceptable? I, how have we come to this place where we are so unmoved? I don't know about you, but I find myself wanting to scream at politicians, or scream at people that I think are responsible, or, or that keep making the problem worse, and it feels more like I am screaming into the void. Do you know that feeling, church? But here's, here's the thing. When I talk about the people that I disagree with, on this, when I talk about what they think, it feels hopeless and it feels paralyzing. But when I have the chance to talk to the people that I disagree with, like really listen and talk, not argue on Facebook, <laughs> really come face to face, listen to them, talk with them, my hope returns every time. 
Because somewhere in there, we find common ground. And somewhere in there, we realize that we both want common good. On this issue, people who support access to guns and people who want to restrict access to guns both want to protect their children. Right? We can passionately disagree on how best to do that, but we have to see that common hope and common fear if we're ever to move forward. Once we come close enough to recognize that, to recognize that we have that in common, maybe, just maybe then we will be moved to compassion for other people's children, not just ours. Maybe then all of our hearts will be softened enough to hear the voice of everyone's children. And isn't that reason enough to try? There will be no peace, as Isaiah speaks of it. There will be no peace until my children are safe with you and your children are safe with me. There will be no peace unless we quit seeing people only as their opinions on issues. We've got to see them first as people made in the image of our God. And church, there is no way to do that without getting close enough and making time enough to have conversations with each other. Even about things, especially about things we disagree on. And it's hard to do, it's really hard to do, to have those conversations. We want to avoid them because it's uncomfortable. But in avoiding those conversations, we begin to avoid one another. When our assumptions about someone's political affiliation or their views on this or that issue, when that is the way that we enter any interaction with someone, it, feel, it can feel like the conversation is over before it begins. We already know what they think, right? We all do that. It's almost like we've forgotten how to talk to each other. Or we've at least forgotten that we need to. All this polarization and animosity here in this country and even globally, it's not just in the United States, but it's led to a lot of research on what is driving this shift and how we might disentangle ourselves from this pattern that we seem to be stuck in. The Polarization and Social Change Lab at Stanford University was researching a variety of interventions and activities that maybe could be used to reduce this partisan anger. And they found that one in particular was extremely effective. And they found it, in all, of all things, an ad for Heineken beer. <laughs> There's a four-minute ad that features a real experiment by the Heineken company that pairs people with opposing viewpoints to work together to achieve a goal. In this case, it's assembling a bar and a set of bar stools. But then they sit down to have a drink together while they discuss their views. Now, I am absolutely not promoting a beer company in worship, <laughs> but I would like us to watch this video together. And I hope it's gonna work. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe hit the, there we go. Oh, sound. Mm -hmm. This is really important. I want you guys to hear it. Can we figure out the sound back there? Ah. 
Today we will <laughs> pray for our sound equipment. <laughs> well, hold on one second. Let's press pause. Is there any way to hold a microphone up to the laptop speaker? Will that work? Okay. It's okay to take time. <laughs> Let me see. Mm -hmm. Will it play from there, the sound? It should just. Hey, hey, all right, start it back over. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> and Alan. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. All right. There we go. Why would this word my political views as the new one? I say that next. Women do need to remember that we need you to help our children. Could I be friends with someone that says women's faces in the home? Um. Right, okay, well, I'm an expert at flat packs. If you have any trouble, just watch me. So it looks like I've got your instructions here. I think so. Let me help you. Let's have just that bit there. Describe what it is like to be in five adjectives. Okay. Frustrating. Dedicated. Opinionated. Lucky. Ambitious. Offensive. Solemn. I have ups and downs. Strong. I was going to say attacked. Misunderstood. Name three things you and I have in common. We're both male, we're both confident, and we're both loudly spoken. We know each other better than people who've known each other for 10 minutes should. You seem quite ambitious and positive, and you've got this really, um, got a glow. Okay, <laughs> your aura is pretty cool. I'm sensing, are you, uh, for military or something? People have said that, but there is no, really? there is no history. So are you then? Ex. Ex-military? Yeah, yeah. If you're ex-military, I'm very proud of you already. Oh, sorry. I grew up. Uh, in a bit of a rough state. I've experienced homelessness. I've known what it's like to have absolutely nothing. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely most grateful just, just for life. We've only just met, but I think you're the sort of person that would listen to me and we'd have a discussion rather than, oh yeah, you could hang out with man. Let's go. Okay. Joking. <laughs> 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 well, I'm having a drink. I'm 
I'm going to try again. I will discuss fail. Yeah, fail is fine. Cheers. And you know, even if you wanted to convince people about your point, the productive thing to do would be to sit so down. Engage, and so engage. I've been brought up in a way where everything's black and white, but life isn't black and white. Yeah, I'm just being. Yeah, <laughs> smash the patriarchy. <laughs> I'll give you my mobile number, you give me yours, uh-huh. and we'll keep in touch. I'd have to tell my girlfriend that I'll be texting another girl. <laughs> 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 It's a powerful ad. Not for the beer. <laughs> it's a powerful ad for coming together across our differences. I don't know if you could understand all of it. There were some thick British accents there, but when they didn't know what each other thought about these issues first, they were able to see the good in each other. They were able to find common ground. And then, when they learned those things, they were more willing to talk to each other about it. Because they saw each other as another human being, not an opinion. What I find especially remarkable about this video is that according to research conducted by the Stanford University lab group, they found that even just watching this commercial led respondents of their study to significantly soften their view of the other side. People didn't even need to have an experience like that on their own, even just witnessing it. Witnessing others engaging in this kind of bridge building, it was enough to make an impact. So church, do you realize what that means? It means that when we find commonality and find compassion for those with whom we disagree, others are inspired to do the same. We don't have to preach. (laughs) We don't have to shout and scream into the void. We just have to choose to outwardly build these bridges over the walls that divide us. And when we do that, when others see us do that, it doesn't just soften our hearts, it causes the walls in others to begin to crumble. And people think, well, if if they can do it, maybe I can too. If that wolf and that lamb can find common good in one another, then maybe there is hope for all of us after all. My friends, There is so much hope. There is. It matters that we in the church claim that hope and live that hope. Our children, these little ones, they need us to believe in the peace that God promises. They need us to not get trapped in despair. They need us to believe that we have good things in common and that we can move forward. They need us to believe that God has given us what we need to change the world. So believe out loud. Hope out loud. Love out loud. That's what compassion is. It takes faith, courage, patience, all of these things. But it's all possible. It's all within reach. And compassion will illuminate our way forward. Alleluia. Amen. As we turn to prayer, let's sing our prayer song in your bulletin.
about if Jesus was in the business of healing. <laughs> Whether that was physical or spiritual, and often those two things were quite intertwined. He responded to suffering differently, teaching that all people are worthy of healing and whole relationship. And it inspires us and our response to live like that, to be his body in the world. So we change our story, our narratives, and respond differently for the sake of the world more even than for our own lives. We come to prayer today as those who are in need of compassion. Our most bonding realization in times of trial are that we are all hurting and we are all in need. <laughs> Ironically, it's these times times of feeling hurt that we are most likely to hurt others, isn't it? So we call on the God of overcoming to help us address the wounds within us and around us with balm, not making it worse. So we pray together the prayers of the people with a depth of faithful compassion for each other's plight. We begin with a responsive prayer. Let us pray. We pray for healing for ourselves and others. We pray for belonging for ourselves and others. We pray for the spiritual capacity for compassion for ourselves and others. We pray for the ability to reach out beyond our wall walls. for ourselves and others. Holy, loving, and compassionate God. We know what compassion is because of you. Because Jesus lived compassionately. Jesus lived vulnerably. He was moved by the suffering of others, the suffering of the world. So God, today, teach us to live compassionately. Soften our hearts to be moved by the suffering of others and of the suffering of the world. Help us not get paralyzed in fear or in anger. Guide our feet as your people. We pray for more conversation, more understanding, less fear, less hatred, less dismissing of the other before we begin. Lord, heal the divisions between us. Lord, your world has so many needs. Hunger, violence, homelessness, abuse, addiction, poverty. There's so much need. And you never intended for any one of us to meet them, but for all of us. Remind us that we need one another so that your kingdom may come your will may be done. Lord, turn this, your creation, transform it and us more and more into your kingdom. Today, especially, we lift up victims of gun violence, the community of Wilder, Georgia. We lift up the students and the teachers and the staff in that high school, Lord. Surround each person with the healing that they need. And give us the courage, the courage to move, to be moved, 
not just for those children, but all children, all people here and around the world. Lord, hear us now as we speak the names of the people on our hearts today, as we speak the situations on our hearts today so that we can be in prayer with and for one another. Hear us now. Or turn our fear into hope. Turn our hope into compassion and loving action in the world. Hear us now as we, your people, pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Honor as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloveds, not a week goes by that I don't hear some way or another, from someone who has been positively affected by a connection with Amity Presbyterian Church. Not just people here. I meet people all the time. Oh, I went to preschool there. Or, oh, I, went, I remember going to youth group 40 years ago. Or, you know, they, they know this place. Or, I used to come get food on Wednesday during COVID. This church is a church of compassion, and folks know that. They have received compassion from Amity Church. So when we give, when you give, you are giving so that we can continue to be Christ's body in the world in this place, continue to be a community of welcome and belonging and compassion. That's a powerful witness in a world in great need of compassion. So I give thanks to God for you and for all that you give. If you'd like to give today, you can give in the plates at the front or the back, or we have a QR code there in your bulletin. You can give online. But however you give, give with the peace of knowing that God will turn it into miracles. Give freely. Church, let's rise and sing our closing hymn, Number 753, make me a channel of your peace. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there
Beloveds, may the Holy One show you the way to do unto others. May the Christ, whose light is the center of all that is, ground you in the assurance that no one is outside of love. May the Spirit show forth through you in extraordinary acts you never imagined that you had the power to achieve. And may you know the peace that surpasses all understanding, especially when it's difficult to understand. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing our closing response. in peace, church.